All right, I'd like to finish up with uh, the uterine cycle, which we talked to the ovarian cycle. The uterine cycle occurs in concert or alongside of the uterine cycle. And basically, the uterine cycle describes what's happening to the uterine lining during the entire reproductive cycle. And we're going to break it up into three different stages. The first stage is menses. And during menses, we have a decrease in estrogen levels and a decrease in progesterone levels. And this is when uterine sloughing actually occurs. This is when the menstrual flow is formed. Typically lasts about seven days on average in humans. Then we move into the proliferative stage. And this is going to um, occur alongside of or follow the follicular phase of the ovary. PROG for progesterone. So this follows the follicular phase. During this phase here, we're going to have our increase in estrogen. So estrogen levels drop down, and now they're beginning to come back up. And it's called the proliferative phase because in the uterus, the lining, the endometrium, is going to thicken. The endometrium thickens. And then the last phase is the secretory phase. During the secretory phase, um, well, first of all, it's following or occurs alongside of the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. Um, this is when we're actually going to have an increase in progesterone. It turns out progesterone is uh, really important if you in the thick of the endometrial line. So estrogen uh, levels are still relatively high, but progesterone levels here are going to begin to increase as well. And this will maintain the thick of the endometrial lining, so you have a fertilized egg that implants. We're not just losing uh, that, that thickened uh, endometrium, and it, it remains nutritive and, and environmentally friendly for the fertilized egg. Luteal, L U T E A L, luteal phase. We have increase in progesterone to maintain the thickened lining. And it's called the secretory phase because this is the phase when glands have developed and begin to produce a secretion that will help to maintain a fertilized egg. Now, the other thing that we have going on in the secretory phase is the development of So, yes, there's an increase in glands and an increase in secretion because the strata functionality, um, it, it thickens and then it digresses, right? And so you lose all of that tissue and then that tissue gets replaced. And so not only do you have the increase in glands and the increase in secretion, but you also have an increase in a production of, a creation of what are called the spiral arterioles spiral arteries. So they're actually arterial or spiral arterial or spiral artery. And this brings the, the blood flow into the strata functionality of the endometrium. And it's during this phase where a process called luteolysis occurs. Luteolysis may occur. So luteolysis is going to be basically the breakup of the corpus luteum. So 
So luteolysis is the breakup or the, basically the regression of the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is the leftover shell after ovulation. Okay? So when we have a decrease in luteinizing hormone, this results in regression of the corpus luteum. We also um, exhibit some changes with prostaglandins. To help facilitate this process of luteolysis. So prostaglandin F2 alpha is involved in this process as well. However, there are certain circumstances where luteinizing hormone will actually remain elevated throughout and beyond the secretory phase. And this luteinizing hormone, uh, when it remains elevated, will prevent will prevent luteolysis. So when do you think that this would actually happen? In other words, when might I want to maintain a thickened endometrial line? So they're pregnant. Okay. And so we end up with two different cycles. A non-fertile cycle. I need to orient the screen real quick. So we end up with a non-fertile cycle. This is where we do not have a fertilized egg, so we have no real reason to protect the endometrial lining. So we'll just want to progress as normal with the reproductive cycle, with the uterine cycle. Corpus luteum which is what I'm going to talk about right now, is the corpus luteum regression. Remember, this is kind of that scar tissue that is left over after ovulation. And so scar the scar tissue will regress. It will basically be reabsorbed back into the ovarian tissue. And this typically happens about 12 days after ovulation. So after about 12 days of ovulation, we're going to end up uh, with a regressed corpus luteum. The corpus luteum produces progesterone. It becomes an endocrine. It becomes an endocrine um, tissue. Produces progesterone as it regresses. Progesterone levels decline. Now, what is progesterone important for? It's important for maintaining the endometrial lining. And so as progesterone levels decrease, the endometrial lining no longer has the proper uh, hormone milu. And so we'll get below a certain level and menstruation will begin, or menstruation will, will follow. And so we'll begin to have uterine slump. So this is with a non-fertile cycle. The other option is to have a fertile cycle. So we'll have a fertilized egg. And normally implantation occurs about 10 days after ovulation. Sometimes a little bit sooner than that. But implantation of a fertilized egg will occur by about day 10 at the latest. Now, when implantation occurs, one of the One of the changes that's going to occur is that tissue from the implanted conceptus or the implanted uh, embryo, one of the um, tissues that begins to develop early on is called the chorion. So this is being produced or is developing in the baby, right? So the baby begins to develop this thing called the chorion, and it begins to produce I'm 
understand why it's so far off. So we begin to produce a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. HCG. So HCG is released from the developing chorion, which is from the embryonic membrane development. Does anyone recognize HCG? Perhaps that's good, because that's the hormone that's affected by a whole type of sickness. So when you go pee on the stick, you're measuring urine levels of human chorionic gonadotropin. And that normally isn't present. It's really only present when you have chorion, and chorion only comes from So you, you detect a pregnancy that's not really there. No, you have cross-reactive molecules and metabolites that can be picked up and detected. Yeah, like, I don't know. Good question. Or like in wolves with pseudo pregnancy. I don't know about that either. Um, so it's a good question. I have to look into that. This is the last day of class. I'll do look into it. So after that's that's another potential PhD. After what were we dog by one on the summer chat? You see the quotable bread on. Uh, okay, uh, what are we doing? Um, chorionic gonadotropin HCG begins to be produced, it's produced from the chorion, which is a uh, embryonic uh, tissue. And so basically the, the feedback mechanism that's created here in the presence of chorionic gonadotropin. So those are all some feedback from here, starting with the hypothalamus. You want to? It's relatively large. So hypothalamus produces gonadotropin releasing hormone, acts on the anterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary triggered to release luteinizing hormone as well as a stimulating hormone. These will target to the corpus luteum. So as long as as long as we have luteinizing hormone that's present, we're going to maintain the corpus luteum. We're going to prevent uh, lute luteolysis, right? We're going to prevent the regression of the corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum is going to continue to um, maintain progesterone and and so if we can capture this and keep luteinizing hormone levels elevated, we're going to be able to maintain the corpus luteum, we're going to be able to maintain progesterone in particular with estrogen as well. So normally, estrogen feeds back onto the hypothalamus and onto the pituitary with a negative influence. Okay, so even when the corpus luteum is present, if estrogen levels are maintained to be elevated, hypothalamus is going to decrease its production of natural releasing hormone, and we're going to start to lose LH and FSH. 
So with the formation of chorion and the production of chorionic gonadotropin, HCG is actually LH-like. So it's very similar in its structure to luteinizing hormone. So HCG is LH-like. Human chorionic gonadotropin is luteinizing hormone-like. And in fact, they bind a very similar receptor. And so HCG is going to bind there that receptor. All of this is going to happen still, right? All of this happens even in a fertile cycle. We're going to actually set up so that we start to lose because of the negative feedback on estrogen. Everything leading towards the loss of the corpus luteum, which means that we're going to begin to slump because the gastrointestinal levels will begin to drop. However, when chorion is present, human chorionic gonadotropin, being LH like, binds to a similar receptor and it binds on luteal cells and it stimulates those luteal cells to produce progesterone. So with progesterone levels elevated, we maintain our thickened endometrial lining and we don't cycle back into menses. So we do have a decrease in luteinizing hormone, but because of the presence of chorion, we have an increase in human chorionic gonadotropin. This causes the corpus luteum to be rescued or maintained, and those luteal cells that have just been captured or maintained begin to produce progesterone. Progesterone levels remain high, so we never have um, digression or progression from the secretory phase to menses to lose the uterine line. So human chorionic gonadotropin is found in maternal blood approximately 24 hours after 24 hours after implantation. So the formation of formation of the chorion to produce human chorionic gonadotropin happens relatively quickly upon implantation. And then again, because we have HCG levels being maintained, corpus luteum, pregnancy, maintained. Elevated progesterone it interacts with the uterine lining. That uterine lining to be maintained. But we also have elevated estrogen levels, so this actually does cause that uh, negative feedback loop to be activated. It turns out that becomes important. Why is it important? Well, because if we inhibit that endocrine access, we inhibit oogenesis and follicular genesis. In other words, we no longer are going to be able to progress through another ovulatory stage or another ovulatory event. We're not going to produce another ovum and another follicle and have another ovum or follicle released as long as the corpus luteum is present, as long as pregnancy is present. Right? So that becomes important here that we actually have that negative feedback loop, but we need to have that rest of it. Well, because that negative feedback loop normally reduces progesterone levels because of the inhibition of metrophones uh, and metrophones. So with high progesterone levels, high estrogen levels, 
we no longer, we basically are going to cause both the uterus and the ovary to uh, undergo quiescence. We'll have no smooth muscle contraction. One of the things that have happened to help remove the strata functionalis from the uterine line. Now, the corpus luteum is actually not maintained for the length of pregnancy. We actually begin to have regre regression of the corpus luteum of pregnancy. It starts to regress by about five to six weeks, or really regresses by five to six weeks, but human chorionic gonadotropin peaks out at about nine to 14 weeks, right around that window of nine to 14 weeks. And so then the question becomes, okay, well, don't we need to maintain progesterone if HCG levels drop, corpus luteum, um, Regresses, we no longer have a mechanism for progesterone production from this mechanism, or we don't have a, no longer have a way to produce progesterone from this mechanism. We've lost the, the endocrine tissues that are doing that. And what ends up happening is we're now at a point in embryogenesis where we have a well developed placenta, and the placenta is a, a progesterone producing organism, uh, organ as well. So with With the formation of the placenta of progesterone levels uh, increase from the placenta and we maintain that thick of endometrial lining throughout the rest of pregnancy. And then when that placenta is removed as during the birth process, progesterone levels will drop. And the mother system will reset after pregnancy. Now, one of the things that um, is pretty interesting about pregnancy is in you know in one sense this could be defined as a parasitic relationship right you have um, a foreign organism living in another organism utilizing resources all of that kind of stuff how do we normally deal with parasitic invasion we have an immune system and the immune system attacks that parasitic invasion or that invader and will try to eradicate this is not really a parasitic relationship, though, right? This is a, um, a, a baby that is used to pass on genetic information and all of that. And so we need to actually protect the fetus in the embryo from mom's immune system. So how do we actually go through the process of protecting the baby from mom's immune system? And so what was observed Was that there was a early pregnancy factor that must be being produced that has immunosuppressive effects. And some of the things that were observed in the pregnant female, and a lot of this work again was done in research animals, um, but we had a decrease in T-cell factors that are used in the immune response. There was also production, production of cell surface proteins, cell surface proteins 
in particular a cell surface protein called the FAST, the FAST ligand factors, where factors, yes. So we have these surface proteins that this thing called the FAF or the FAST ligand bind to. And what ends up happening with this early pregnancy factor is the T cells begin to undergo apoptosis program cell death. So this is that immunosuppressive response. We actually induce a higher rate of apoptosis in the T cells, and that protects the fetus from mom's immune system. Um, I have no idea why I stuck this here, but I apparently wanted to introduce prolaxin. This is another hormone um, that occurs during, uh, or that is produced from the female reproductive system. So it's a reproductive endocrine hormone, prolaxin. Uh, this is a hormone that comes from the ovaries of pregnant animals. So this increases during pregnancy. Uh, its overall structure is, is similar to what we've seen before, where we have two different chains, alpha and a beta chain, held together by disulfide bridges. And then you have an internal disulfide bridge as well. Um, relaxin again comes from the ovaries. From pregnant animals. know what else I want to talk to you about with relaxing, other than it just is produced. It has a, a dimer structure. That's all my bridges of the structure. Do what? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does have to be. What I really want to finish out with is parturition. So this is good looking. So you have um, now hopefully an understanding of after conception how we protect the fetus and the embryo so that the, you can undergo embryogenesis. Ketogenesis is all to uh, into a, a what we would refer to as a baby um, or an infant. Um, hopefully you have a pretty good understanding of what's going on to program the uh, external and internal genitalia to become either male or female, program the brain to be male or female. Um, and then we know basically how we maintain all the way through so that we can get to birth. Now let's talk about the actual birthing process. And so one of the things I'm sure that you are already aware of is that parturition or the birthing process, the onset, varies by species. So the onset varies by species. In some species, the corpus luteum will last for the length of gestation. In mammals and in humans, rather, we, we Begin that corpus luteum 
regression five or six weeks. Uh, both nine to 14 weeks is when we see um, the corpus luteum basically fully regress and progesterone production stops from this corpus luteum and takes over from placenta. Do what now? So, um, if I'm remembering correctly, with a two year cycle, elephants have corpus luteum in the last entire, the entire length of their pregnancy. I'm not positive about that, but I, I probably had it. But I think, I, think that that, I think that that is an example where they have a, it possibly um, some of the canine species as well, um, if I'm remembering correctly, which is to say the different pregnancy things that they have going on. But I'm not positive. Um, Okay, what we do know for sure is that there's hormonal changes that occur, and this is really throughout the length of pregnancy. And so just to give you kind of a rough sketch here of what's going on, on the x-axis I have time, and then on the y-axis would be different concentrations. And so progesterone actually starts out as maintained for a prolonged period of time, and then it begins to dip off. Estrogen. Levels begin to rise towards the end of pregnancy. I guess I did lie to you. Um, progesterone stays high and then it begins to dip, dip off. Again, progesterone. is made by the corpus luteum, and it decreases with corpus luteum regression. So progesterone is made by the corpus luteum. We have a decrease with the corp uh, a decrease in progesterone with, as the corpus luteum progresses. Yes, P4 is progesterone. And so the role of progesterone at the end of gestation, um, it's going to maintain the pregnancy. Pregnancy is maintained by some of the mechanisms that we've talked about already. If we have a withdrawal of progesterone, so progesterone levels for some reason drop, that drop will lead towards a termination of pregnancy. You may know that as. Um, Miscarriage, right? So progesterone levels drop and induces termination of pregnancy or a miscarriage. Not that all miscarriages are necessarily related to progesterone, but if you lose progesterone, it leads towards miscarriage. Progesterone is also going to increase or help to increase beta adrenergic receptors. will inhibit alpha adrenergic receptors. And by <clears throat> altering the adrenergic receptors, increasing beta, decreasing alpha, during pregnancy, and as we lead towards parturition, we have changes in the catecholamine response. In other words, catecholamine, epinephrine and norepinephrine tend to have 
um, slightly different effects during pregnancy and during parturition compared to the non-pregnancy physiology. Okay, so lots of different things that are happening here as progesterone levels are changing. Uh, we're also going to see a decrease in the oxytocin receptors. And we'll begin to in see an increase. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm moving ahead too fast. Uh, oxytocin and decrease in estrogen receptors. An increase in the storage of prostaglandin precursors. Increase in oxytocin, decrease in estrogen, increase in the storage of prostaglandin precursors. In particular, we're going to see an increase in the storage of arachidonic acid, which is a prostaglandin precursor. We're also going to see a decrease in the production of prostaglandin synthase. So progesterone is doing a lot of different things as we as we uh, move in towards the end of gestation. So with humans, humans. have some placental things that happen, uh, in particular with placental steroids. So in humans, because of the placental steroids, progesterone levels do not drop prior to parturition. And it appears that in humans, to progress through parturition, what may be critical is what's known as the progesterone estrogen ratio. Progesterone estrogen ratio may be critical. So in humans, it appears that we get to a point where progesterone reaches about three times greater than estrogen. Kind of like a three to one ratio. And because there's so much more progesterone here compared to the estrogen, this is this phenomenon is called the progesterone progesterone block. So we form this thing called the estrogen block where we have a much higher estrogen, progesterone estrogen ratio. If there is an increase in estrogen, this would result in a decrease in the ratio. And what ends up happening here is the estrogen is said to stand out, which just simply means that we notice the effects that I just described above are, are 
are basically different than when we have a normal progesterone to estrogen ratio. And the effects that are noted in response to the increase in estrogen are basically the opposite to progesterone. Opposite to progesterone. So we'll have an increase in prostaglandins E and F to alpha. There's an observed increase in the presence of gap junctions between the myometrium. Prostaglandins E and F2 alpha, two different prostaglandins, isoform E and isoform F2 alpha. So those prostaglandins increase in their presence in the blood. We have an increase in the presence of gap junctions in the myometrium. During non-pregnancy, for most of gestation, We would normally observe few or no gap junctions. So when the estrogen levels increase, we end up with more gap junctions. Okay. So in humans, at least, it looks like this ratio, much, much higher levels of progesterone to induce all these changes that I, that I had identified previously, um, are the high levels of progesterone to important. So how do we actually undergo the birthing process? And so you basically all know what needs to happen here. We need to have an induction of uterine contraction. And it's going to be oxytocin that is going to help facilitate the effective contraction of the myopedia within the uterus to expel the um, infant from the birth. However, what we observe is there's actually a very low production of pituitary oxytocin that still leads to normal parturition. The normal parturition. So, how does oxytocin actually affect parturition if oxytocin levels normally are low? Well, there's an increase in oxytocin receptors, and in particular, making the myovitrium very sensitive to low amounts of oxytocin. So, it's actually the receptor number that becomes critically important here. for parturition. However, in addition, the pituitary hormone levels are low, but oxytocin of the placenta or the fetus, fetal, appear to actually stimulate these very sensitive oxytocin receptors. So oxytocin is probably not produced by mom at the point of parturition. It's produced by the, the fetus or the placenta to initiate that um, to initiate that process. Okay, so oxytocin induces uterine contraction, most likely coming from placenta and fetal origins. Very little from pituitary origins in the mom. Now, the prostaglandins um, the prostaglandins have some effects here as well. 
um, it's probably where I should have the picture. So we have this structure called the ductus arteriosus. Um, instead of trying to describe this, let me let me bring up a picture real quick so you can kind of see what's going on. So this is this this structure is being maintained during pregnancy by the presence of prostaglandins. Okay. Okay, that's not very descriptive at all, is it? Um, yes, this is happening in the heart of the baby. basically have this bypass so that we don't circulate blood to the lungs of the, the of the fetus. We bypass the lungs because we're getting oxygenation and nutrients from the mother's blood supply. And so we're basically only utilizing the right side of the heart, which is, uh, well, no, that's not true. Let me rephrase that. We're utilizing the right side of the heart to bring blood back into the heart but then we're bypassing out the pulmonary system and going directly into the uh, arterial system. So we're not using the left side of the heart to pump blood um, out into the, the aorta to accept blood back to the pulmonary system. That in adults, obviously, that's not a good thing, right? We want to have this. Um, we want to have this removed. We want to have that tissue right that digress so that the baby's heart will cycle. Right side, left side, the So during pregnancy, the prostaglandins are going to maintain the ductus arteriosus, which is a good thing, right? Because we want to cycle past the pulmonary circuit. We don't need to use the pulmonary circuit. However, certain prostaglandins, PGF2 alpha, if the PGF2 alpha is infused through an IV, or if we go directly into the amnion, the um, fluid surrounding the baby, intraaminotically, PGF2 alpha would induce delivery as early as 14 weeks. PGA, uh, PGE induces labor in all women in the third trimester. So during pregnancy, we probably don't want to have high levels of certain prostaglandins, but we want to have some prostaglandins that are going to be able to maintain the ductus arteriosus. And so we inhibit the production of some of these prostaglandins, but then we'll turn these prostaglandins on, which may actually help in uh, stimulate the birthing process. By the way, prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors are a class of drugs that are used to stop premature parturition.
But when we do this, we don't just inhibit the concern for prostaglandins of concern. We inhibit the other prostaglandins as well and show with the uh, prostaglandin synthesis inhibition, we stop preterm labor, but we also cause closure, premature closure of reductus arteriosus. So we eliminate the, we basically um, eliminate that connection between the fetal pulmonary artery and the aorta, and we no longer bypass the lungs. So we've got ductus, ductus arteriosus. No longer we, do we bypass the lungs. And so if you kind of go back at the end of parturition, right, prostaglandin level, I'm sorry, uh, progesterone levels begin to drop. Um, so progesterone maintains pregnancy. We now begin with, with we withdraw. Um, we either will terminate pregnancy or if we're at gestation, the end of gestation, we'll begin to go through this process of um, end up going through this process of uh, parturition, and you'll see things like the prostaglandin precursors, they begin to be um, released. This is important, this um, prostaglandin, prostaglandin release is important after parturition or near parturition because we do need to close up ductus arteri <coughs> arteriosus. Because when they born, we're going to need to cycle blood through the lungs so that we can oxygenate uh, from the baby on its own as, it, as the baby breathes because we're going to uh, cut off that uh, umbilical supply. I guess I just have one more thing, which we're just about out of time. Uh, four more notes, just to show you that there is differences across even mammalian species. Um, so in sheep, a lot of the stuff that's just been described in humans happens in sheep as well. But one of the things that happens in sheep that's a little bit different in terms of inducing parturition is there's an increase in activity of the fetal adrenal gland. Adrenal cortex increases ex activity, and this becomes essential for parturition. So while changing in progesterone levels is what leads towards human parturition, in sheep we actually have change in the fetal activity of the adrenal gland, which increases cortisol, and it's the cortisol that will change estrogen and progesterone levels leading towards parturition. <laughs>